Welcome to UNSW's Engineering the Future podcast, a series where we'll speak to academics and industry leaders who are embracing cutting edge ideas and pushing the boundaries of what is truly possible. In this episode, we'll take a deep dive into exciting developments in the mining industry and discuss what impacts we can expect on society as a whole over the next two decades. We'll hear from leading experts in the field, Professor Ismet Jambalat and Ray O'Brien, as they explain how new technologies will help bring about the required six-fold increase in the extraction of critical minerals that are needed to produce the likes of solar panels and electric vehicles. They'll also reveal the reasons why mining won't just be confined to Earth in the future, but will also be happening out in space as we attempt to colonise the Moon and Mars. So join us as we discover how world-changing action starts with fearless thinking in Engineering the Future of Mining. Hello, and welcome to Engineering the Future of Mining. My name is Neil Martin, and I'm a journalist and STEM communicator working in the Faculty of Engineering at UNSW. Joining me today to discuss how mining will change the world in the next 20 years is Professor Ismet Jambalat, who is a mining engineer with over 30 years' experience in research, consultancy and management and is now the Head of School of Minerals and Energy Resources Engineering at UNSW. Welcome, Ismet. Thank you, Neil. Thanks for the opportunity, and I look forward to our discussion with yourself and Ray. Yes, and also with us is Ray O'Brien, Executive General Manager of Mining Excellence with Centennial Energy Company. Ray is Chair of the ACARP Board, a mining industry research organisation, and has more than 25 years mining experience, including many years within site and corporate operational management, as well as roles in business planning, risk and strategy functions. Hello, Ray. Hi, Neil. Hi, Ismet. Great to be here. I might start by acknowledging that in recent years, mining has faced criticism for its negative environmental impact and social consequences. But as the world shifts towards renewable energy production, many experts are saying that mining is almost certain to play a critical role in the extraction of minerals necessary for technologies like solar panels, wind turbines and electric vehicle batteries, making it a crucial component of the transition to a greener future. Ray, if you were to look into the future, what do you see for the industry? So I guess um, if I recap on what you said before about the forces shaping the future for mining. So as mentioned, one of the biggest ones, the geopolitical and market forces are at play and this transition to a low carbon or a net zero carbon economy is driving a huge demand for electrification minerals. So I've heard numerous accounts of numbers, but essentially the latest one is we need to mine in the order of six times the amount we're currently mining in terms of those electrification minerals if we're going to hit this net zero target to build all of the infrastructure we we require. And I guess the other thing that we're likely to see because of a number of those uh, drivers is expansions of current operations. So our resource bases for minerals like copper and and others, a lot of the high-grade minerals have been mined already and the easy accessible minerals. So we're likely to expand into lower grade and more complex geology. And we're probably likely to see remining of old mining waste or what was deemed as waste before. As processing technology gets better, we'll be able to remine a lot of that old waste and extract more mineral out of it. I do think there's a lot of remote sensing technology we already have that we're not using to the degree that we could be. So if I go back to where you said the increase of uh, minerals which are essential in clean energy production, Ismet, what are some of those actual minerals? Um, What are the challenges? You talk about a six-fold increase that we need to produce those minerals. What kind of challenges does that bring? Well, there will be a lot of challenges, particularly around what Ray talked about, is the increased production. Right, increased production mean we will have to do more selective mining with much less waste and then uh, much faster and much more productive than what we have right now. So that increase is not going to happen overnight. Amount of critical minerals that we will have to mine, there are lots of them. By the way, critical minerals is defined by minerals that are used in renewable energy 
sector and other supporting sectors to renewable energy. But what is included in critical minerals vary depending on the country, right? So Australia has got its own list of critical minerals and elsewhere. But the important thing is to me is that how is that sixfold increase going to happen, right? And that can only happen with increased productivity, increased resource recovery, and an increased uh, investment into mining operations. And obviously that means uh, there will be uh, many more mines opening up in Australia yeah. and elsewhere to be able to provide those critical minerals into the market. And what are the actual minerals that we're talking about here? Yeah. When you look at uh, a conventional car versus an electric car, International Energy Agency predicts that there will be five times more requirement for critical minerals. Those critical minerals include anything and everything from copper, lithium, nickel, uh, manganese, cobalt, graphite, chromium. There's a huge list of it. First of all, the electric cars will definitely need it. The cars that you see on the street today uses five times more critical minerals than the conventional cars that we used to drive and we still drive them. And when we look at the different energies, for example, offshore wind and onshore wind, solar photovoltaics, they will require enormous amount of critical minerals. So when I look at the list, currently coal and natural gas use uh, really about 2,000 kilograms per megawatt energy generation critical minerals. But when we look at, for example, offshore wind, it's 16,000 kilograms per megawatt energy. So that is like eight times more critical minerals will be required to be able to sustain or achieve the net carbon zeros by 2050. I might ask, Ray, if this is where the mining industry is headed 20 years into the future and there's more of those critical minerals being produced um, for cleaner, greener energy production, do you think that will change the perception that people have of mining? I think it has to. I think people are starting to change, like even in the last sort of six months, and people realise that we need mining for this transition. We can't do it without it. And and that also goes for the energy side of things. So a lot of these elements or a lot of these minerals occur in a very low grade. So rare earths, called rare earths because they're rare, <laughs> they occur in parts per million, which means you've got to move, you know, millions of tonnes of just dirt just to get, you know, a kilogram of whatever it is. So From an energy perspective, it's actually a really big challenge. Mm. It can't happen without mining. If I can also come in there, what I project what is going to happen in the future is because the need will increase exponentially if you want to achieve net carbon zero by 2050. And then if we can't produce those critical minerals, those critical minerals will be bottleneck for the net carbon zero future. And uh, if they become expensive, that means the energy will be very, very expensive as well. So we need to be able to produce them at a reasonable cost and obviously sell them at a reasonable cost so that they can get implemented in renewable energy technologies. But I suspect there will be changes in renewable energy technologies as well as we progress towards uh, 2050 because uh, as much as mining industry is changing, The renewable energy industry is also changing. They're looking at different batteries uh, using potassium rather than cobalt. And, you know, there are a lot of changes coming into battery technologies, renewable energy technologies like UNSW is uh, the uh, leading institution in the world, increasing the uh, effectiveness of the solar panels, right? So that means uh, there will be more and more... uh, energy produced from the solar panels for a given same size solar panel, but that will come by time. But nevertheless, whichever way we look at, the mining industry will be required to support the renewable industries. And then I think I agree with Ray, the public's perception towards mining is changing. What we need to change is going into environmentally friendly, sustainable mining practices, looking after the communities, Uh, That will basically bring people into believing that, yes, we need mining and then we will need mining in the future going forward. Do you feel that mining has been demonized recently over the past sort of 10 or 20 years? Absolutely. Absolutely. As soon as we talked about mining, I mean, being at the university, 
we are exposed to public. And as soon as you talk to public about mining, first thing that they come to their mind is coal mining, right? But they don't realize the fact that mining is also necessary for renewable energy technologies. There will be some coming from the recycling as well, but the amount of recycling is getting less and less as we make the parts more and more sort of uh, smaller and more uh, integrated into other parts as well. And recycling also uses currently a lot of fossil fuels too. So that will change as well. Maybe there's a public relations exercise there over the next 20 years as well, Ray. Yeah. I mean, I, I've i been mining for quite a while and the reason why I did do mining was because I have got an environmental conscience I deliberately went into mining to try and do things right and do things well from the inside. You can make a lot bigger a difference from the inside than you can throwing stones. But I accept there's not a lot of real knowledge. If it's not grown, it's mined pretty much. Everything you use every day comes from mining in some way. If I can give an example there, look at the chemical industry. Right, Chemical industry 20, 30 years ago, was really dirty. It's a bad industry. Everybody wanted to stay away from the chemical plants. Everybody thought they were pumping all the, the waste chemicals into the river streams and all that. But look at it now, how it changed. So mining industry is changing and it will change. And there's been so much improvements from being, you know, responsible mining operations, you know, compared to 20 years ago, for example. So much people like Ray coming into the mining industry, like myself, I'm also very conscious of the environment and we are trying to change everything and make it, you know, as clean as like we're walking on the street. Yeah. So some of that might lead into my next question, which is about the new technologies that might exist um, in 20 years time for mining. And I think a few of these are already coming in. I, I've read that drones are being used in mining already. AI seems to be permeating every industry that exists. So I'm sure that there's an element of that that can be used. Robotics. Can you maybe talk about what you see for the technology of mining in 20 years time? The particular project I'm thinking of is called Rock Vision. So what it was, they put some geophones, so they're just listening for sort of sonic noise through rocks, and they placed it in the a panel that was being mined. And the purpose of that project was to get the geophones to listen for microseismic breaks happening in the strata above. And that particular mine had a periodic waiting problem where they couldn't predict. So basically the rock above them would break periodically and really weight up their equipment. And they'd had some big problems in the past. And the project proved successful. The um, geophones could easily help predict when they were going to see increased cracking above them. And um, that never went any further because it was just too hard, too cumbersome to try and put in place. But now you could do the same thing probably even with fiber optics. Fiber optics can be a very, very powerful tool. You can pick up all sorts of waves through fiber optics and easy to install. And from a processing power point of view, you can't even compare. So it's making that process just massively more efficient. Is that right? Yeah. And the other thing that I think I mentioned before, we have a lot of automated, a lot of machine sensing, so a lot of machine telemetry that we don't really use. So I'm talking about underground probably more so that in a long wall situation, for example, every bit of equipment there has got telemetry on it. And you could be using that information coupled with the rock visioning in front of you to be reading what the rock's doing around you. That's not happening and we've got it all there. We're just not using it yet. And then from a scanning point of view, you mentioned drones, but we should be and we are starting to use scanning a lot more. So drones allow you to go in an open cut, go and look at the high wall from angles that you wouldn't have been able to do before. Drones have been widespread um, take up for drones to manage blasting. So filming of blasts is actually now a requirement and drones allow you to do that very safely because no one needs to be there mm. and from different angles and it's just really, really powerful. And, you know, drones, it, it's really the vehicle to carry the scanning tool or, or whatever that you're using it for. That's what makes them so powerful. Drones are being used a lot for surveying in particular. It allows you 
again, access to go and see from different angles. And then the processing power we've got now allows you to process that information very, very quickly. So I think rock visioning, so remote sensing, machine guidance and scanning and processing. Any other new technologies, Ismet, that you can foresee in 20 years' time will be common? Neil, I totally agree with Ray what she said about new technologies, but there will be more such as satellite monitoring is, has always been in the mining industry for the last 10 years or so. I remember myself using satellite monitoring, but it wasn't uh, frequent enough to be able to monitor certain things. But I think as we put more and more satellites into the space, we will be able to do more satellite monitoring. We will be able to see everything from the space as to what the mining operation is doing. And particularly for looking at the environmental impacts, we will be able to do that. And plus, I think there will be a lot of equipment for monitoring, but where the power is going to come in is going to be 3D visualization integrated with artificial intelligence, right? So machine learning algorithms working in the background and try to eliminate people's decision making through using those technologies. And, you know, everything and anything that we develop, it will need visualization. And I think we are moving away from sitting in front of the computers and we will be sitting in front of the 3D, I don't know, hologram tables, one we have at, at the university here at our school, and uh, virtual reality and other technologies to be able to automate, to be able to make things way more visible. Uh, currently, we collect a lot of information, right? So when we go to the mine site, there's enormous amount of information that is collected, but not used because we don't know how to use them. But now with the visualization, and integrated artificial intelligence in the visualization will make it so useful, so helpful for the operations to increase their effectiveness. And I guess the knock-on effect of that as well is that the skill sets that people will need are going to change. Absolutely. Absolutely. Skill sets. And that's what uh, we're trying to train our engineers here at our school and at UNSW very, very early so they get exposed to these technologies because that's what they will be using in the in the very near future, right? So they learn how to do visualization. They know how to integrate data coming from sensors that Ray talked about and putting it into a visualization software and then making it visible. The power of visualization is enormous, right? So once you see things happening, that gives you superpowers to be able to make a quality decision, whether it's safety, whether it's environment, whether it's productivity, anything and everything. But all of those technologies will come in together and then they will be all compatible at some stage. I mean, currently we are working on it and a lot of things are compatible, but nevertheless, in the near future, it is going to be like day-to-day operational technology that we will be using in the mines. I see you nodding in agreement there, Ray. Yeah, absolutely. So, I guess that's one big aspect from a people and a skill point of view, but for all the reasons that we've mentioned before, that the resources that we're looking to mine going forward are going to be highly complex in terms of not just geology, not just grade, not just processing, but location and logistics, like carbon side of things, and getting, um, you know, more partnerships with local communities and the whole supply chain, the whole value chain, it's actually going to have to be more of a partnership between all of those um, parties so that everyone benefits from the exercise. And really, when you put all that together, what we actually need is really exceptional engineers. And, And it's not just across one specific skill. We need people who are able to be across that full suite of issues and challenges. So this is why we can't just write off mining. We actually need more exceptional mining engineers going forward, not less. Ismet, I might take you back to something you said before, which I agree with, that when you say the word mining, you think of coal. Um, And obviously, we're trying to move away from that with regards to um, cleaner, greener energy. Do you think coal mining will have vanished in 20 years' time? And if not, Why not? I think coal mining will be with us uh, for some time to come. I mean, let's think logically, right? There are developing countries and they have all the rights to be able to use the coal as their primary energy source. And it will happen. Although it's changing, it will happen. But whether it's 20 years, 30 years, it will at some stage vanish. 
and we're going to have to rely on other energy sources to be able to do what we do with the energy. Particularly, I'm talking about not so much household energy, but I'm talking about industrial energy. Carbon footprint of mining operations will be the number one challenge. And big mining companies are really pushing very hard to be able to reduce their footprint. So coal mining will stay with us for some time to come, right? Because of developing countries or reliance of developing countries on, on coal as their primary energy. In developed countries like Australia and the US and other countries, it may vanish earlier, but other parts of the world where they need energy and there are still billions of people without energy, they will need coal for some time to come. So it sounds like, Ray, there's a little bit of a time lag there between developed nations and developing nations. Do you agree with that, that it would just take those developing nations some time to catch up? Yes, absolutely. And there are thousands of high efficient, low emissions coal-fired power stations being built across Asia and India at the moment. So I guess that just one point on that, that Australia's um, coal-fired power stations fleet, there's a lot of ageing coal-fired power stations and many of them will close soon. So I want to talk first about thermal coal then about metallurgical coal. But from a thermal coal perspective, Australia's black thermal coal is nearly a third to half again more energy, so got higher in energy content than other coals across the world. So particularly coals in um, India, Indonesia, a very, very low calorific value in comparison to Australian coal. So Australian coal, the Newcastle index is around 6,000 kilocalories per kilogram. Some of the Indonesian coals, Indian coals are around 4,000. The higher the, the energy content of the coal, the lower the emissions are going to be. So we've got, you know, for the same amount of tonnage, you, you get a lot more energy out of it. You could probably emit half the emissions out of a 6,000 plus kilocalorie coal than you would out of 4,000. So Australian coal is going to be still in demand. Exactly, exactly. So for that reason, but the other reason is this whole transition, and I'm talking about energy coal still, um, Ismet mentioned it for manufacturing of the infrastructure like solar cells and steel and Anything that needs intense heat, you're going to need that sort of big baseload power stations. And whether that be coal or gas or nuclear, you kind of need that sort of level of energy for the silica, for solar cells, like for steel and, and any other sort of alloys or, or metals. You need intense heat. So there's going to be a huge amount. We haven't mentioned that I've heard lots of different numbers about the amount of energy we're going to need to get to that point as well. It's a big number. We're probably going to need more coal-fired power stations than, than what people think. And for that reason, we need to have some form of carbon capture and sequestration or storage. There needs to be a lot of focus on that side of things for the transition. But on metallurgical coals, coal's not just used for making energy. Coal's used for a raft of things. It makes a lot of chemicals and the like. But one of the other bigger uses is for steel making. So a big portion of that is for energy in the steel making process. But the other point is steel is a, a iron carbon alloy. So you actually need carbon in the steel. So for a fair while yet, I think you're going to need metallurgical coal until all these other technologies come up to speed. But yeah, I just wanted to make that point. Not all coal is for power generation. I think in China, for example, they don't have much oil or any oil a lot of their chemicals, the petrochemicals, come from coal. So there's a lot of things they make out of coal that are not power and it's not steel. We're talking here so far about things that we mine out of the ground on Earth. In 20 years' time, can you see mining happening away from Earth, on Mars or on the Moon? And if so, what does that look like? Well, uh, it's a good question, Neil, but the question is not if, it's when, right? I'm not an expert in this field. I mean, we have uh, experts in the school and UNSW as well, obviously, but the current target is not really the minerals. Current target is just the water, right? We need to be able to find the water somewhere in the space so that our uh, space rockets can go to that place and get the water and then convert that water into hydrogen fuel and then carry on with their journey wherever they're going. So 
The current focus is on water, but there will be spice mining. There are a lot of uh, spin-off companies coming up, new companies coming up, looking at exploration and mining. There are other other opportunities, companies looking into, uh, such as asteroids, such as moon, wherever they think there's going to be minerals that we'll be able to use in the space. Now, this is important, Neil. We don't want to bring the minerals from space into Earth. We want to use the, the minerals in the space, wherever it is, for space activities. And what's the reasoning behind that? Can I answer this one? <laughs> okay, Ray, you go, yeah. <laughs> no, I happen to have the privilege of going to visit NASA a few years ago. And basically, I think uh, my numbers are probably out of date, but it costs about $11,000 per kilogram to lift it off the earth, get it into orbit. So the less weight you take with you, the more likely you are to get off orbit. You just can't take everything with you. So the idea is if we are aiming to go to the moon, we are aiming to go to Mars in the whatever the time frame is, you've got to be able to make what you can with what you've got there. So very different reasoning than mining here. So we actually have no idea what's there. So a lot of the technology we're talking about in mining, like remote sensing, is going to be really important in space as well so we can understand what the rock is and, and whether we can actually use it. Mm. And Neil, number one reason why we want to do space exploration and, and mining activities is uh, human settlement, right? So uh, there will be human settlement somewhere in the space, whether it's Mars, whether it's somewhere else, but there will be some, some human settlement for various reasons. And like you said, you need to create everything for the settlement, for the people who are potentially going to live there. Absolutely. I mean, we're not going to process gold in the space to bring it down to Earth to sell it. We're going to produce gold to use it in semiconductors and chips and, you know, in the space technology and for human settlement more than uh, making money out of it but using it for day-to-day -day lives on space. Yep. I think Elon Musk has said that he can foresee this happening quite quickly. If I was to ask you for the time frame that you think this will happen, what kind of date would you say? Well, I think it might happen, I don't know, 20 years down the line. I mean, it is happening right now, right? So we work with NASA to be able to look at the water sources and where it could be. And we look at the mineralization of the different rock types and things like that. So it is already happening. It's not that we're just dreaming right now. It is happening as we speak, but it will intensify as we go next 10 years. It will be way more. And then the following 10 years will be more. Would you be putting your hand up, Ray, if there was an opportunity to uh, be one, one of the first to go and be the mining expert that goes to a colony on Mars, for example? I reckon I will rely on the remote sensing <laughs> from here. <laughs> but I think that might lead to what I think might be the final question. Space, obviously, is always exciting and offers new opportunities. But if you were a 16 or 17-year-old thinking of getting into mining as a career, what would you be most excited about in general? Well, I think the most exciting thing to become a mining engineer right now is to be part of the solution, right? Part of the solution for renewable technologies. The mining engineers will contribute to renewable energy technologies and, and implementation of those technologies as much as any other engineering discipline, if not more, right? So therefore, there is going to be huge potential for mining engineers. I mean, we talked about coal mining, right? I should have mentioned that there as well. Coal mining will stay with us, but coal might be used for something else. Right. And the next generations, we are working on it right now. Our American colleagues call it carbon ore, right? So extracting critical minerals from coal and then using the coal for high value chemicals that Ray talked about. So the mining engineers will do it. Uh, there are other opportunities as well, such as, uh, you know, traveling opportunities as part of your job and, you know, going to different countries, different parts of the world. Or space. <laughs> space as well. Space as well. Ex exactly. Exactly right. Space as well. At the end, you get uh, paid the best salary as a graduate engineer in Australia. So, I mean, I don't see any negatives of being a mining engineer right now. But when we talk to school kids coming to our school, the moment, as I said before, the moment you talk about mining, the first thing that comes to their mind is coal mining. And we need to change this perception and we need to be able to tell them, we're not 
going to produce a coal miner out of you. We're going to produce a mining engineer that understands from mining operations, extraction of uh, those reserves and helping the nation, helping the you know, humankind on earth. And uh, Augusta Space is another story. I worked with a number of people and we get people from NASA as well. Geologists work at NASA, right? So there is your business to be able to look at what is on Mars surface and moon surface and to look at different rock types. And mining engineers will be able to one day take what they produce and turn it into a valuable resource for human settlement on space. Well, I guess um, it is a really exciting time to get into this. You have a real opportunity to make a big difference, not just to yourself, not just to your organisation, but to your country and to the whole world. So one thing that mining engineers do more so than, than other types of engineering is you have to be across all of these different technologies, all of these different disciplines to actually make sense of the overall plan going forward and actually have a really good business head on you as well. So it is, it's a really exciting time. It definitely sounds exciting. And thank you both for such a fascinating discussion about the future of mining. I'm sure the next generation of mining engineers are out there listening and excited to play their part in helping to change the world over the next 20 years. Professor Ismet Jambalay and Ray O'Brien, thank you very much for joining me. Thank you, Neil. Thank you, Ray. Thanks, guys. Unfortunately, that's all we've got time for. Thank you for listening. I've been Neil Martin, and I hope you'll join me again soon for the next episode of Engineering the Future. You've been listening to the UNSW Engineering the Future podcast. Don't forget to subscribe to our series to stay updated on upcoming episodes. Check out our show notes for details of in-person events, panel discussions, and more fascinating insights into the future of engineering. Engineering.